Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, uh, What's Hot in HR Tech. Today, we're going to be taking a look back at uh, some of the biggest trends in 2012, and of course, a look forward to 2013 and beyond. My name is George Anger, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Check.com. I'll be your moderator for today. So let's do a quick review of some ground rules before we get into it. Um, first, as attendees, um, everybody there is on mute. So no matter how loud you yell and scream, we still can't hear you. Um, or just because we've muted you doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. Um, in fact, the questions today are both welcome and encouraged. And uh, there's a couple ways to join the conversation. One would be on Twitter via the hashtag uh, at checked. Um, and secondly, you can use the, um, uh, uh, the questions tab over in the um, GoToWebinar uh, panel on the right-hand side of your screen and, uh, and ask questions. I'll do my best to sprinkle them in throughout the webinar. And I know uh, our panelists are also going to be monitoring this on, on uh, Twitter. So uh, we'll try to sprinkle in the questions throughout and make this as interactive as possible. Um, third, uh, GoToWebinar is uh, kind of notoriously uh, difficult sometimes on audio. So you may have an easier time dialing in instead of using the uh, voice over IP. You can do that um, uh, via the number that's on the screen there and the meeting number, or you can, uh, you can get that same information out of the audio portion of your GoToWebinar uh, panel on the right. Um, you know, we're going to try to finish today's session at 2.45, but I happen to know that we've got a lot of topics and some um, great and knowledgeable panelists. So um, uh, even though we advertise the close at 2.45, there's going to be a good chance that we're going to go beyond that, uh, possibly till, uh, till 3 o'clock. So that's just a heads up there. And uh, last, well, there will be options to reach us at the end via survey. You also can email info at check.com uh, to get connected directly to the panelists or for any other questions for today. So um, before we get down to the business, I want to give you um, uh, a little bit of background because uh, a lot of people I'm sure are looking for a brief overview at check.com and who we are. Well, in addition to putting on great webinars like today's and producing a giant library of HR thought leadership content on our website, check.com provides a suite of predictive talent selection tools. In short, we add hard data to the hiring process with our structured, competency-based pre-hired assessment and reference checking tools. Checked Fit is a pre-hire behavioral assessment that provides a fast, easy, and powerful way to quickly weed out the least qualified candidates and move the most qualified candidates to the next step of your selection process. Once that selection process has narrowed the field to a small group of finalists, Checked Reference is used to answer the single most important question on every hiring manager's mind. How well has this candidate performed in the past? That question can only be answered via past performance history, which checked reference gathers from former managers, colleagues, simply, quickly, and with incredible accuracy. Checked reference makes reference checks relevant with an automated reference checking solution built on assessment-based logic. Uh, that's it for the commercial for today. If you want to learn more, um, you can uh, visit our website at uh, uh, checked.com. So now let's meet our panelists. Uh, first up is William Tincup. He's the CEO of the HR consultancy Tincup and Company. William is one of the country's leading thinkers on social media applications for human resources, and he's an expert on the adoption of HR technology. And I can speak from firsthand knowledge here that he's a damn fine marketer too. Uh, William's been blogging about HR related issues since 2007. He's a contributor to Fistful of Talent, HR Tech Europe, and HR Examiner. And he also co-hosts a daily HR podcast, which you may have heard, called Drive Through HR. Welcome, William. Uh, welcome to be here. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Boom. Second, we've got uh, Tim Sackett. He's the president of HRU Tech, Tech, Technical Resources. It's an engineering and IT staffing firm. But Tim has 20 years of HR and talent experience, half of which is on the vendor side, half on the corporate side. So he brings a pretty, pretty cool per, per perspective here to the panel. He has a master's in HR from Central Michigan University, and he's a contributor to Fistful of Talent and blogger number one at the highly famous Tim Sackett Project. Now, Tim's also a collector. So far, he's collected three sons one Hall of Fame wife, a Honda minivan, and a 1980 signed rookie Magic Johnson Laker trading card. And I'm sure that's worth a lot of money out there in Michigan. Uh, 
Hello, Tim. Hey, how's it going? And definitely, people always say, like, Hall of Fame wife, that's so nice of you to say, but she actually is a, in the Hall of Fame at the University of Wyoming for volleyball. And so I said, when I first put that out there, I never thought what people would actually react to. And they're like, oh, you're such a sweet husband. I'm like, well, no, it's a fact. <laughs> Take, take the compliment, Tim. Take that's the compliment. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 one you shouldn't have clarified. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, third on our panel is Greg Moran. He's the founder and CEO of Check.com, and Greg is also the author of two books. There's Building the Talent Edge: A Field Manager's Guide to Recruiting the Best, and Hire, Fire, and the Walking Dead. Greg's a leading thinker in the field of human capital management, having been quoted in numerous national publications, including Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, and Inc. Magazine. And just yesterday, Greg also made the uh, made made a new quote list as he was as he was quoted in the Hudson Valley, Hudson Valley Herald Record, a real career making achievement. Um, Greg is also an avid triathlete. Uh, earlier this year, Greg ran and finished the Lake Placid Ironman. It's a uh, it's a short 140-mile swim, bike, and marathon jaunt through bucolic upstate New York. Uh, so Ooh. welcome, Greg. Thanks. That's what you call getting really, really lost for, uh, for 15 or so hours. That's really all that is. Uh, so before we get to our questions, I'm going to launch a poll. I can't even sleep for 15 hours, by the way, let alone run, swim, and bike. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, that's you. you can, it requires a lot of it at the end. I can tell you that. <laughs> All right, George, you want to introduce this poll? Yeah, so we're um, asking a poll question about what uh, what our audience thinks is the biggest trend in 2012, and uh, our options are consolidation among vendors, growth in social media as a talent acquisition uh, source, growth in web-based selection tools or growth in performance and onboarding, or other, because it's possible that we didn't know everything here. Um, so I'll give people a few more seconds to answer that questions, and then I'll close the poll. While you're answering those, while you're answering those, uh, those questions, bear in mind, uh, again, to interact with um, each other or, uh, or us on the panel. Um, use hashtag check, C-H-E-Q-U-E-D. The, uh, the, the, I guess the French spelling of it is, uh, is what it's supposed to be. All right. So, um, so this is uh, this is Greg, uh, by the way. Uh, um, so, looking at these, looking at the results here, uh, growth in social media and talent acquisition, uh, the big, uh, the big winner for uh, for 2012, at least among our, our fully scientific uh, scientific approach here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, before we kind of throw this out to uh, to my colleagues on the on the webinar, I mean, I know I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised. I thought for sure number one here, the consolidation among vendors was going to be the uh, was going to be the winner um, because I think more than anything else, that's uh, well, it's probably just because we're in the industry. Um, but that is uh, that's to me seemed to have the biggest effect on. Uh, on you know buying decisions this year and on so many other uh, so many other factors in terms of product roadmap and the way the vendors are going and and how HR technology was going to uh, was going to play out. But um, Tim and uh, Tim or William, what do you guys yeah. uh, what do you guys think? Greg, you know my first reaction was I, I mean to me the consolidation like you said because you're in the industry and you know from a company standpoint probably had a big impact because there was a lot of news out there about it. As an HR pro sitting kind of in the trenches literally no impact to my life whatsoever. And so besides the interest, right, because I have an interest in HR tech, so I love reading about it, but if I talk to anybody, and I, you know, we kind of go, and, and William does a lot of conferences too, and you talk to kind of run-of-the-mill HR pros around the country, they would even have a care in the world about what the hell success factors and connects them to you know, AO is doing. Um, for the most part, you might be like a 1% of 1% of that has a real kind of like, oh my gosh, this is going to impact my world. Um, so that's my perspective. William? Sure. I, you know, they're the, the kiss and cousins of themes, trends, and buzzwords. When, you, when we're beaten with something, I mean, absolutely beaten 
with something, it's usually it's a buzzword. Um, the themes that have developed over 2012 for me that I think are actual trends both at the strategic and tactical level uh, are really fourfold. Uh, big data, social, mobile, and talent communities. And any one of these four things, you're beaten with it as well. Uh, because um, what what happens in marketing and sales and business development is we use these code words because they're per they're perceived as words that buyers want to hear. But I think if you if you kind of paw your way past that, I think what people are really trying to, is they're trying to make sense of it all. Um, whereas we're we're kind of to that 2.0 3.0 perspective of I'm tired of just a dumb database, a dumb database in succession, a dumb database in compensation, a dumb database in applicant tracking, a dumb database in payroll, a dumb database in any of the assessments, etc. It dumb data is so last year or well for the last couple hundred years. People are just tired of it and I think that there's really no nominal difference between Excel and what one can do with pivot tables and dumb data. And so big data, there, there actually is some legs to big data uh, from the perspective of how can data inform you? How can you take all this shit, excuse me, stuff that's all either working by itself or even loosely configured and, 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 and brought together and how can you get real knowledge out of all of that data? So what can the data do to inform us? What can it do to teach us? What can it do to predict or forecast? And I think we're not there yet. I mean, I don't think any of the vendors are there, uh, quite frankly. Uh, but I think that if you were to, you, you, if you want to just sit back and listen to how vendors talk, you're going to hear big data, social, mobile, or talent communities, depending on where they play in the map. Or you might hear a combination of those four words, you know. And and I so but I think what's what what you know consultants and analysts and practitioners what we all have in common is I think what next year will be about is how do we make sense of data and what does that look like? I mean, do you see, who do you? I mean, do you see anybody um, William that is that is kind of taking a lead on that at all so far? Have, have you seen anybody over the past year that uh, that's sort of stepped out in that direction? to actually be able to manage the, that flow of data effectively? Uh, two, two players, I think, uh, what is now ex, you know, Experian, but it was uh, eThority that was bought by Talks, now rebranded as Experian. The, uh, they, they're both sitting on a ton of data, both consumer data and, and, uh, and workplace data. But eThority is, is a, it's a, it's a data visualization uh, application, if you will. Uh, and what they can do with data, looking at large amounts of data and then rolling that up and letting people actually get kind of the roll up of that is, is, is pretty astounding. And what's really cool for their play is they're sitting on both the consumer data with Experian and they're sitting on workplace data. So they can actually tell you, you know, out of, out of all of your employees, here are the ones that are most likely to steal from you. And here, <laughs> because they've got they've got access to credit reports, they've got access to all kinds of consumer data. Now the other players out of out of uh, uh, Vizier, which is out of, uh, of of I believe Vancouver, uh, in San Francisco, they're a business intelligence play. So they're a BI play that came from outside of our space, and they basically say. You have all these applications. You have 13 different payroll systems, you know, 22 different assessments, etc. We're going to roll that data up into uh, the cloud, and then we're going to roll dashboards off of it. And really, well, that's all you care about. As an HR leader, you just want to have access to the dashboard. When someone asks you a simple question, and you've got 42,000 employees across 120 countries, a simple question is, how many employees do we have? But if you ask that person that question, most of the time they don't know exactly how many employees they have because the systems don't talk to each other. Right. So, so I take, I think, Greg, I'm not to, not to, you know, not to sell either of those two plays. I think it's just fascinating that both of them come at the market in a little bit different way. But Vizier is basically saying you don't really need all these systems connected together. You need their data connected to, to together mm -hmm. so that you can run reports and do dashboards. 
Right. Right. You know, um, I mean, in the in sort of the spirit of, of not necessarily promoting, I don't have anything to do with these guys, but I, I think um, the one that I'm seeing that's kind of doing some really cool stuff around this is uh, is Talonpin, actually. Um, and dealing with a lot of data aggregation um, through social media. I know this is something in my little piece of the world um, that we deal with here with, uh, with selection and trying to pull sort of all of this data that's out there on a candidate, right, and through, you know, various forms of social media and social profiles and sort of the stuff that is kind of out there in the ether on a candidate. I think, um, I think there's some interesting, I, I don't think we're, I don't think, you know, we're, we're quite there yet in terms of, of what, how to make meaning of, you know, social profiles for selection purposes. And I'm, I'm really talking about the sort of pre-hire here, but, um, but I think those guys are doing some interesting stuff around. It. I don't know, Tim, if you have any, uh, if you have any thoughts about yeah, this in terms of, you know, I've, and I've looked at Townbend too. I mean, it's narrow, and I wonder in my in my mind because like you know, I do some IT stuff, so it works out really well for that. Um, but all of a sudden, you you kind of jump into okay, hey, I need to find an accountant or a buyer or purchasing, and in the aspects of what you can pull in uh, in an accountant situation becomes a lot more limited. Um, and so, but but in a, in one segment of the industry, I think it could be you know, could have a huge impact. I do agree with William. Vizier to me is one of the easier things for an HR pro to kind of get their arms around because you don't need necessarily because you know what's what's the option we have, right? We go out and find a find a full talent suite that does it all. It's all connected. It's one you know one giant kind of dinosaur system, enterprise system that we're going to have. And then they were going to be able to pull our information. Well, most places just don't have that option, right? We already have this one, we bought this one, and two, you know, so we have three or four systems which we're dealing with. Um, and Visier kind of says, hey, we'll just take all that data as you can, you know, in the different formats, and then we'll throw it back at you. So that becomes more of the easier kind of, hey, plug and play. How do I do this fast, cheap, and, and make it happen with analytics that can help me start driving, you know, some better business decisions? And I think that's the HR thing. You know, is how do we get in there? So how do we take all this HR data to help drive some better business decisions? And, and you know, and so that's the difficulties. And I think that's where most people struggle because, and I know when I've worked in really large companies, when I worked at Applebee's, we had 250,000 employees, and it's what William said. Like some an executive would ask a question, and 10 people could give him 10 different answers that were all correct. <laughs> You know, and then you were like, oh my gosh, now I can't trust anything because I don't know what's correct. You're like, well, it's all correct. It's just coming from different angles. So how do you kind of, you know, consolidate that and make it one way? I think it's really difficult to do. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts of this, you know, we, and we have conversations like the, around this with, um, with buyers all the time. And I, I think that the challenge is, and I'm hoping that, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of, I think the next stop we're getting into your too is um, you know what what does 2013 look like and I, and I think William kind of hit on it I mean you know we're we're there's a lot of conversation around um, how to manage data how to make it predictive how to how to make it meaningful from an analytics standpoint the the challenge I find and, and even being inside the industry I find myself saying I don't really understand what any of that means um, yeah. yet you know and I don't I just I can't I don't know how it necessarily applies yet, and I think I'm hoping that you know in 2013 we start to see that. What about um, what about on the social side, guys? I mean, we, you know, something that we hear constantly is all around you know use of social and mobile, but particularly social for selection for recruiting, but even from a performance standpoint. I mean, what what are your thoughts around uh, what are your thoughts around that? Anybody doing any anything interesting there? Anybody? Um, Anything interest, intriguing that you saw in 2012 that you think will continue on in 2013 in a in a larger way? William, you want to go? Go first. Sure, 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 sure. I think you know the thing is is the audience. I think if you solve for social, or when you solve for social, you 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 basically solve for the audience that you're trying to uh, to work with, and so it's the audience inside of a company, but it's also the the end consumer, and. You know, how adept are they at social? What mediums are they using? What type of content do they like, et cetera? Uh, I, I don't think you can force anybody to do anything. I think ultimately what you do is you fit yourself around kind of what they are already doing, and you make it easier so you can enable, uh, if you will, but you can't force. And I think social is one of those deals that, you know, I think for a long time, HR has wanted to put their head in the sand around social uh, and just hope that it went away. 
because they saw it for what it really is. It's the new water cooler, but now instead of the water cooler being in, you know, in behind the veil, if you will, uh, it's out in front of everybody. Uh, and I think if you would have, you know, been out on the, uh, you know, on the road in, in 07 or 08, you'd have seen a lot of people that are really terrified about social. Now, not as much. I mean, you'll still see it occasionally that people are terrified about a particular a medium like, like Twitter or something like that. Um, but I think from the vendor's perspective, I think it's, I think it's, does social make sense? Uh, and I think, uh, again, vendors uh, sometimes, is what will happen with the vendors community is they'll just look at their competitive set and say, well, they're adding a social collaboration fee, uh, piece. We need to have that as well, rather than, you know, does it make sense to our audience? If, if someone's using our ATS and they want to be able to source, uh, you know, people based on their different social profiles, then that makes sense because of their audience are, are recruiters and they want a feature that is socially oriented. Uh, again, if it enables somebody, uh, great. If you're trying to force corporate recruiters to source off of Twitter, not as cool. Uh, I don't think you get near the uptake when you when you try to force people to work a different way. I think you just give them the option if it, if it makes sense for them and the and the audience that they serve. Um, in terms of you know, social and, and things that I've seen that are working. Ironically, I've seen some things on the iPad in terms of training that are, are uh, both social uh, uh, and, and kind of using the words gamification, if you will, but people that are, that are using uh, games and social, social tools to then get teach people how to use application. I think there's, I think there's really good content there. Uh, and I think there's a couple of vendors, people fluent work day. There's a couple of people that have done really, really fantastic work of how do you get people to use the applications using social and mobile and gamification. So I, that's that's where I'd start, Tim. Yeah, you know, I think um, I always try to separate HR shops into like two buckets, right? One is the really large kind of Fortune 500 bucket, and then it's everybody else. And we tend to really focus most of the tech talk on this Fortune 500 group because they're the, they have the big money, right? They're, they're the ones that are going to have this advanced technology versus the small and medium-sized shops out there. And so when I take a look at that, um, you know, I tend to kind of go, okay, great, I get it. You know, the big shops are going to kind of run the decision-making of a lot of the, a lot of the companies because that's what's, you know, who's buying. But then I, you know, I'm more drawn to the 80%, right? The larger number of these small and mid-sized shops that are just kind of like, okay, now what? How do? What do we do? What's the tech out there for us? And to me, a company like a job bite or a good job that's doing some referral-based kind of this viral kind of referral marketing type stuff um, with your employees has an instant impact to a small and medium-sized shop, and it's really inexpensive. Um, I was, you know, again, I'll, 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 I'll throw you guys into the mix at check. I was at a Fortune 500 company last week and talked to them out to eliminate from their process of doing reference checks, unless they want to do kind of a, 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 a one that's going to have an impact, right? Because they were doing the standard, hey, um, give us give us your three best friends and the, the you know the kind of the mom, you know your mom's you know you know boyfriend and all this stuff, and then we'll check those references and oh they always come back great. And so I think a lot of that stuff, I, I'm always looking for the tech that kind of has the, the impact there. Um, to those shops, and so from a rather inexpensive overall cost to them in their annual budget um, that has a big impact, to me, it's those little pieces um, from that standpoint. Now, from the social aspect, I still think, you know, as we go forward and we take a look at like 2013 or whatever it might be, whoever figures out the Facebook thing, and we take, you know, branch out, kind of had a stumble there, Monsters Be Knowns never really take off. But there's a there's just a gigantic, you know, pool of talent there. That's it's it's actually there's some people doing some some cool things, recruiting, you know, uh, you know, kind of hardcore sourcing stuff out of Facebook. That's how I think you know small medium sized shops, the, the the larger number of HR people. You know, we keep thinking that like it's it's not a big deal anymore that we all kind of get social. And I spoke at Green Bay two weeks ago. You know, we had 100 people in the room, all HR people, standard Midwest, cheese-eating, Green Bay, Packer-wearing, great people. And I would show the hands how many people allow your employees to get on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. 95% didn't allow. And we still think that, you know, that that's, that's done now, that we're beyond that point, and we're not. 
I mean, we're still very much controlling within the corporate environment in America in terms of social. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, you know, I think we take it for granted because we live in this world of, you know, dealing with it every day. And, you know, we're sitting here talking about a hashtag checked if you want to interact with us, <laughs> um, yeah. which was also a plug for uh, if you want to interact with us. But um, but the uh, but, you know, I think we take it for granted that uh, that, you know, the, the there's a whole lot of the world that's out there that's just not uh, that, that is just not using it for, uh, you know, for recruiting yet. So let me, before we move on, guys, let me just wrap this up real quick. I mean, we got a lot of HR people on this uh, on this on this webinar today so somebody sitting there they're hearing about social they're hearing about big data um, these are big concepts right and uh, we've been talking about it from uh, you know over 2012 and looking forward to 2013 I mean real quick if you're an HR manager um, in a, uh, a mid-sized company or a large company or even a small company I mean um, sum this up for these guys I mean what what do you before we move on to the next slide here what do you what, what are the one or two things that, they, that somebody can do to start to get their head around um, what they should be doing for their organization um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I think the first thing you've got to do is is raise your raise your game in terms of just 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 being aware of what it, what is out there. So I would probably start just as probably Tim and I started. I would start looking at blogs. I would start consuming content, um, and and possibly with the intent to crowdsource questions that you have uh, on any in any medium that you you're really comfortable in so let's just not assume that you're uh, 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 comfortable in any medium you start with LinkedIn groups find some groups that you really kind of find yourself that you kind of like uh, the people in the groups ask a question uh, like the HR technology conference that, that we all love um, they have a group it's got 15,000 members you know, start a thread hey have a quick question big data for companies under 100 employees what's the one thing I should be looking at and you know what you'll have people that will give you answers um, it might not be exactly perfect but the the idea is I would I would raise two things I would consumption of content blogs um, anything on the web just anywhere where you can find inspiration from people that are like you or speaking to uh, to you I would consume content on the other side, I would start to participate uh, either through Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or hell, Instagram. I don't even care. Just find a place where you're comfortable and start to ask questions. And I think that you start those things and you start getting really good at, at curating content. Ironically enough, as you consume more content, you can quickly get to a point of looking at a, you know, a thousand blog posts and knowing, mm, you know what, here's, here's the 10 that I really need to pay attention to. Uh, so, you, you know, over time, you, you can develop kind of that muscle memory where you can get really good at curating content. But the other crowdsourcing, there's, there's no easy recipe. You just get in and ask questions and answer questions when you feel like you've got uh, an answer where that, that's worth putting in front of folks. That's where I'd start. Yeah, I mean, I got one little thing do, I can add to that. Other, otherwise, I mean, I mean, William hit it. I mean, now I mean, he just hit it out of the park with that. But it for me, it was when I started on Twitter probably what three years ago um, to where I am today. And I started out. I was the lurker, right? I was kind of the creepy person that just never talked, but just kind of watched everybody else. And that's a great start. It's a it's a great way for everybody to start. It's just kind of hey, I'm just going to be out here and work. I'm going to I'm going to follow a lot of people. They'll follow you back. It's kind of the way it works. And then little by little, you'll get comfortable. Um, and so then you can start. But now I have this HR international pool of people that are experts. I mean, if there's anybody right now that's an expert in social, they're interacting. And you can go and follow them. And then if you ask them a question, I, I mean, 99 out of 100 times, people will answer you back and help you out and go beyond like you ever thought to give you kind of free knowledge. And so for me, that's, you know, that's, again, one of the things I think people just have to do. Otherwise, I mean, you know, William, he got, he got it all. So. Yeah, I think the only other thing I'd, I'd, I'd add to that, and this is kind of your point about uh, your Green Bay experience, Tim, is I think, um, you know, if you're, if you're in HR today and you've got those restrictions still around social media, you really got to look at starting to, uh, starting to um, loosen the reins a little bit. I mean, I think one of the things that, that anybody will tell you when it comes to recruiting with social media is your employees are going to do half the work for you or most of the work for you. So you've got to start to loosen those reins. I think. Well, um, Greg, I think actually, uh, I'll, 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 say, I'll say it like, like you're saying it, but just a little bit differently. You don't have to loosen the reins. Uh, but you're just going to drive smartphone usage up because people are yeah. still going to go interact with social. Uh, 
<laughs> so <laughs> you know, you know, you don't. No, no, seriously, you can you can lock yeah. down the desktop, and you've done a fantastic job. People will now use their phones more often at work. And if you lock down the mobile phone at work, you're just going to drive them out to the car. They're oh, still yeah. going to consume. Con they're still going to consume social or the interwebs in whatever way they want. You may as well make it easy so you can get them back to being productive. Right. But right. I digress. Right. Absolutely. 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 All right. So, kind of All right, so we're kind of moving on here, guys, and and, so, and shifting from 2012 to uh, to 2013. Um, you know, if you are advising an HR manager and HR director in terms of where their uh, where their uh, top management team, where the C-suite is going to be looking in 2013 and what those expectations are going to be in 2013. What do you tell somebody? What, what do you think the road looks like in 2013 here? So, I, you know, I, I, I'll start because I've had a couple conversations with CEOs and big companies like 10,000 plus employees in the last two weeks and both of them had the number one thing they said and this is totally different conversations but it was increased talent. How do we increase our talent right now? Now, People immediately go, oh, it's a recruiting thing, right? Well, no, it's not. I mean, think of that concept of increasing talent. You can go to your OD department, you can train, you can develop, you can do all, you know, succession comes in there. There's all that whole kind of around the realm of how do we get better as an organization? Now, clearly, I can go out and recruit top talent and bring that in, you know, but, uh, you know, it also gets into performance management and how, my, how is HR now working as kind of executive business coaches to our managers to, get, to treat so they can learn how to actually develop talent and, and, and encourage talent and all that thing that happened. And, and you know, and it was the two different industries. One was healthcare, you know, one was retail, and they both said the exact same thing. And I think there's this, they're finally starting to feel that what we felt or what we thought was going to be coming was that we have a lot of older workforce that's, that's starting to kind of hint to us that it's almost time. You know, it's, it's almost time for them to go. And then they see all these younger people coming in going, oh, boy. We, we have a serious problem that's going to hit us. We have to figure this out now. And we kept saying that. The last five to ten years, HR, we kept talking succession, and, and we'd play around with these stupid succession plans on expel, expel sheets and, and try to, you know, again, it gets back to Williams' data kind of thing, right? Like we have the data, or at least we think we have the data, but how do we use it? And to me, it's how are we using it to increase the talent because they think that's really going to be the competitive differentiator. And then 2013, and so it, it, it kind of goes back to that, right? And so for me, the tech side of it is how are we utilizing our tech so that you can go do this from a strategy standpoint in HR? So you know, how are we making everything self-service in terms of our employees so that they, they can kind of go out and get this stuff? Because a lot of times HR has so many administrators in their departments, and that's how we get the bad rap, is because they're trying to administer so many processes. Well, heck, now we have the ability to really at a low cost bring tech in and have the technology do this for us and make it a self-service model. And it allows then these business professionals in HR to go out and really start to move the organization forward. But I think it's a huge leap in a lot of organizations to make that happen. I think I think Tim nailed it. Um, the only things that I would add is that the the rest of the executives, what they really want from HR, is they want you to be 80% strategy and 20% tactics. Whereas where we we've all kind of fallen into the opposite, uh, where we we largely have discussions and conversations and and uh, mandates around tactical initiatives, or where we've strategized tactics, if you will, uh, but but being really strategic. Well, how do we become really strategic? We need to get our time back, which means that we need to really displace things that are tactical. We need to outsource them. We need to, there's more refinements that need to be made so that we can get our time back so we can be strategic. I think with a you know if you kind of boil past that, what really the executives want from us is they want knowledge and wisdom. You know things like causation and correlation. They want to know that stuff from us, and and I, I think if I had a theme for this, I would say we need to stop playing defense. We need to we need to start playing offense in HR, and I think you know showing them a clear uh, vision for the 2020 workforce, if you will, like what does work look like here, you know, eight years from now, seven years from now, 20 years from now, like do we have an idea, a vision for what work looks like in the future? Um, I think I think. In general, I think what they want is they want HR to push the rest of the executives, uh, and in 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 a way that's that's you know not uncomfortable, but where we're not just a receptacle 
of everyone else's great ideas or whatever, where we're in the room pushing them with our great ideas. And so to be able to, to intellectually, to be able to do that, A, you have to have the capacity, B, you have to have the time. You actually have to have the time. If you really want to push people, you really actually want to create a vision, have, have time to do str uh, strategy, you actually have to have time to do so. Whereas I don't know if a lot of HR for leaders have the time to really do those things. So I think what does the C-suite want out of us? It's, it's, it's a mixture of all of those things, uh, Greg. Thanks. I think, uh, and George, you, you got a uh, couple questions from the audience. I think you want to jump in with, right? Yeah, there's a good one from uh, Paul. He's asking, um, what are the ethical con considerations a firm should recognize regarding access and utilization of social content in HR decisions? If I use this decision in hiring decisions, would I not use it in other personnel actions as well? And then how far is too far? Will my asking this question eventually perhaps come back to haunt me? So a very interesting <laughs> question about the technology uh, overwhelming the personal interactions. You know, you know, George, it's a great question. I, again, when I go back to my, my Green Bay conversation, one of the questions that came from the crowd was something about this. And, and so I just had, hey, quick quick raise of hands. Who's ever Googled a candidate um, before they hired them um, to help make a decision? And I swear to God, not one person in the entire room of 100 HR people raised their hand. And, they're all liars, and I call them that. You guys are all lying. They all laugh because they knew. They're like, well, I don't want to admit to it because we can't. But they were lying. We all do it. And I think there's data out there that shows like 85 to 95% of whoever, you know, it's like a large number of people are going to be Googled and Facebooked and all this stuff before that hiring decision is made. And, you know, and so it, I think it's a reality we have to live with, right? We have to know that we're going to collect every piece of data we can as an HR person to make it the right hiring decision for our organization and we need to utilize that in the proper way um, and it's the same thing it's the same um, level that we would hold our hiring managers to we need to hold ourselves to and if we do that I'm comfortable with that um, and, but I think there's some people get really nervous about even talking about it so Tinka what do you got? I would uh, I always tend to ask for forgiveness rather than uh, ask for permission so I, I live my life that way I would have a fantastic uh, employment attorney on speed dial and uh, or at least uh, you know get their counsel and then go do what I think is you know moral and ethical and within the values of the firm and you know if you're if you're waiting for everything to be easy you're, you're gonna be waiting on uh, your life for, for things to be easy. Uh, personally, I would just go and make decisions. As long as you're within the values of, of the firm, the company that you represent and your own values, I, I think you'll be fine. And, you know, will you, will you overstep? Yeah, possibly. That's what lawyers are for, to fix shit. <laughs> well, it's a classic HR dilemma, right? It's, it it's, is. We, we, try, we try to eliminate 100% of risk, and yeah. thus by doing that, you know, make some bad decisions instead of saying, hey, I'm just going to make the right decision for the organization. I understand we might be putting ourselves a little bit at risk, but if I'm doing the right things, I'm willing to, I'm willing to kind of go to the plate and have to, you know, to kind of go, you know, to face that picture, I guess. Um, no other point. department, Tim, to your point, no other department carries that, that cross. No yeah. other department has that burden. In finance, they don't live like that. In sales, they damn sure don't live like that. In marketing, <laughs> they don't live like that. They just do what they believe is in the best interest of the firm, and it all gets sorted out. But uh, I think as an HR leader, the thing I would do is make sure you have great counsel. So, I mean, there are some fantastic employment attorneys out there uh, in, the, in the U.S. There's great firms. There's great, you know, individual solopreneurs, et cetera. Surround yourself with great talent. Done. Check. Then go and do what you believe is in the best interest of the firm and stop waiting for it to be easy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I think I think the uh, the only other thing I would add to that is, is you know, the, the reality is you're going to uncover stuff that you don't want to uncover about candidates, no matter how that information is coming to you, right? We've all had interviews and reference checks and all kinds of stuff where, you know, we've suddenly found out information about somebody that, uh, that we, we really wish we hadn't just heard. And, and it happens in every form of information that we're getting back. And I think to cut off such a critical uh, piece of it, I, I just think becomes really artificial. Um, and, you know, I, I, I agree. I just think, you know, you've got you've to do what you think is right. And, um, 
and do what's in the best interest of the company, I think, by, by cutting off a, a supply of information that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, if you're going out and you're using that information in a way it shouldn't be used, just like, you know, if you, if you found out in an interview that, uh, you know, a candidate was pregnant, you didn't hire them because of that, or you found out some other piece of information that you wish you hadn't just found out, well, then, you know what, you, you deserve to be punished. As long as you're not dumb about it, I think we've got to be looking at, uh, we've got to be realistic about the, the type of information that's coming to us. Yeah, you um, know, I, tell, I, I tell HR pros all the time, where, you know, there's a, there's a thousand reasons I can give you right now legally of why you should hire that person or you should fire that person. Just don't use one of the unlegal ones. <laughs> I mean, I mean, just be smart about it, you know? I mean, sometimes we're just so dumb. It's like, hey, look, yeah, we decided not to go with you because you were pregnant. No, you didn't. <laughs> and literally, you'll run into people that that's what they said, you know? And you're thinking, now, you could have said, hey, we decided to choose another candidate that had more qualifications than you had, and, that, and, and you can always make that happen. But you don't tell them, you know, it's like, well, I didn't want to lie. Well, then you're now going to face, you know, the legal system. Congratulations. Right. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and, and moving, up, moving on here, since we're, uh, we're getting a little bit, uh, we're getting a little bit behind, George, um, if you want to. Uh, and, and real quick, guys, I just want to, let's spend, uh, you know, a minute or two on, uh, on this and, uh, and then get into, uh, get into the last slide here. But, um, you know, a lot of discussion uh, over the past year here around, uh, around, you know, quantity of applicants really kind of moving from sourcing to overall quality of hire. We see it a lot on the technology side. We hear it a lot in conversations with, um, with uh, with HR uh, professionals, I mean, what do you wh what do you think? Um, you know, are we seeing a shift really from sourcing over to quality of hire as sourcing becomes more commoditized? Is that kind of short lived? Will that continue to be the uh, the way things move? You think? No, I think with the way the way the market is shifting with workforce demographics, I don't I don't think the quantity thing is going to go away anytime soon. I think quality has always been there, um, but depending upon the environment, like the quantity. The quantity piece went away because over the last five years, quantity was easy. Right. And, but because of the because of the economic situation. But as the, as that improves, and as we get into a workforce demographic that's retiring faster than we're bringing people in, um, that's going to be an issue. Um, and so don't forget about that because five years from now we have the same conversation. We're going to be talking about quantity, 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 and screw the quality. Just get me a body. And you know. And but I think. The quality aspect is always one that's there. The funny part for me is hiring managers tend to say, give me more, more, more. They're not necessarily saying, hey, quality is the issue. Now, the quality aspect comes up because HR folks are always pressed to give more, 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 and so they want to scream quality. Oh, no, 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 we're just getting you the best candidates. Well, the hiring manager wants to see 20 candidates, and you're going, shit, I'm lucky if I can find five. So the right. five I'm giving you are the quote unquote best quality. Here you go. We're not going to. I'm not going to. I don't want to burden you with 20. And the, and the hiring manager is going, no, I want to see 20. You know, I want to see as many as possible. I want to see everything. They're they're shopping. You know, and they want to see the 20 shirts. They don't want to pick from five shirts. And yep. so that's the issue. It's the chicken or the egg. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think in a lot of ways it's a it's a false choice. You know, um, yeah. I, I think you know we in, in, in we have a lot of conversations around this. That look, it's not it's not about you. You need obviously some kind of quantity to to drive the process, but I think it's really about uh, and, and more and more so, at least from an HR technology perspective, it's really about how do you manage quantity. Um, yeah, you know, you've got you've got candidates coming at you from more directions than you can uh, than you know what to do with, in, in a lot of different roles. And there's some, you know, in specialty roles this doesn't apply, but in a lot of roles you've got candidates coming at you from all over the place. Um, you know, and it's about how do you manage that flow so you're not spending a ton of time man it, real screening low potential candidates. It's it's really being able to efficiently screen out low potential candidates in the beginning. Uh, you know, whether using assessments or something like that and using, you know, hopefully using some sort of automated reference checking on the back end and being really efficient about this so you can spend less time, more time with less candidates that you know are high potential. And I think a lot of this stuff really comes down to, you know, should we focus on sourcing or quality of hire? And I think, I think it's, I don't think you need to choose between the two. I think you just need to be, you need to really look at how you're laying out that process. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's both. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Greg, I, I kind of look at the end game, and for me, the end game is how do I retain top talent? So everything that happens prior to onboarding, quality and and uh, quantity, it's it's really a where do you want to put your aperture of your screens? 
if it's if it's a if it's a game of okay, we we have ten thousand people applying. Well, really pull the screens as far out as you can so that you get to the quality to, so that you get more quality coming through. But let's say you only have twenty people that are applying for a particular job. Well, you're not going to screen them all out. You want to kind of walk a lot of those people through the process. So every firm is going to kind of come to where they're closing or opening the aperture for quality and quantity. But what everyone is solving for, hopefully, is fitability. How does this particular person fit long term, not short term, not for three months, not for six months or a year, but how do they fit long term for the firm? So how do we solve for fitability? And I think it's, you know, the question around quality and quantity for me is, okay, on where do I place my screens? Because I'm going to put a bunch of screens up in front of people. I might, I might decide to put those further back in the process. I might decide to put them further out in the process, depending on volume. Uh, and I think, I think every individual, every hiring manager, or recruiter needs to be able to have the adaptability to then set those screens at different places based on volume. But we're all solving, I believe, we're all solving, uh, hopefully solving for fitability. That's a great point, and uh, and we're we're running uh, we're running a little bit long here, guys. So I just want to kind of wrap it up with one final question. That's that I think you know this goes back to that C level uh, that that C suite issue, and and it revolves around metrics. Um, you know, I, it, I mean, I, I think a lot of what um, where a company's focus needs to be, certainly looking out, is really around metrics. How do you how do you manage this process, and how do you really understand if you're having an impact, right? Um, and curious as to your thoughts on, you know, on on metrics. On if you're an HR manager, if you're an HR executive, where where do you need to be looking to really understand? Are you doing this right? You know, and I think what and the reason I ask is, I know we we have a lot of conversations around this, and and sort of I I, I fundamentally believe that I think we've spent an awful long time managing with the wrong metrics um, in HR. I mean things like you know, time to hire, cost per hour, even turnover, I think is a, I think is a dead metric in, in a lot of ways. I mean, it, it tells you a little something, but it doesn't, it's, it's not predictive at all of sort of what, what impact is your talent having. Um, so I'm curious as to your thoughts around, uh, around metrics and what, you know, what would you advise somebody looking forward this year in terms of really getting a handle on the type of things that they should be measuring and what's going to have meaning for the business? I'll what take a step. Yeah, I'll take a step back. My favorite metric is uh, retention of top talent. If I, if I want to know the, the health of a bunch of different processes that all kind of come together, I, A, have to identify who is top talent, high performers, if you will. Uh, so that uh, bit, so that kind of tells you a little bit about succession, performance, a little bit, a sprinkle and a little bit of compensation, etc. But if you can't retain top talent, there's a there's a, it can indicate a bunch of other failures, uh, so that's my favorite metric. But you know, to the question that's actually you know that's on the screen, when I look at return on hire, I think of that's how business leaders all that's how they talk. Like, okay, we hired you know we hired Sandy. <laughs> Sorry, we hired Sally. <laughs> Nice. You know, what's been the return? Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Right? Guy that's in Texas right now, not the New Yorker in the bunch. <laughs> fair, fair, fair statement. We have tornadoes down here. So, uh, you know, what was the return on on uh, on Sally? You know, we hired Jim. What was the return? So, business leaders already talk like this, and I think there's a bigger story to return on hire because what what, what we're really saying with return on hire is that that it's not enough just to have someone there and kind of get, even get them in the job fast. Um, you know, the time to fill is always a kind of a favorite metric to kind of pick apart. Um, but did that person actually do the job? Were they a performer? So how do you tie uh, something like recruiting uh, and onboarding to performance? And how do you tie performance to incentives? And how do you tie incentives to compensation? And how do you tie compensation to succession? And how are these things all tied together? So I look at return on hire and I say, much bigger story. It can actually give you a lot of health, specifically on the hires that you make. And I think it's the language, it's already written in the language that business leaders already use. Yeah, you know what's a, to me, you know, William is amazing is that just a, a theoretically, right, every person you hire in your organization should have a subsequent drive to revenue. 
So you're going to increase your revenue because you hired this person. If you aren't going to increase your revenue, then why did you add that person to your organization? That has to be a huge conversation that somebody should have. Now, how many organizations run that way? Almost none. Because can you imagine sitting down with a business leader of, let's say, you know, sales or sales might be the easier one to actually prove it out. They pr they probably feel more of the stress of of driving revenue than anybody. But let's say accounting, right? So hey, we need to add another you know finance person for analytics. Um, you go okay, you know, so we tie this much revenue towards the finance department. So now you know now you have to increase that by two percent because we just gave you another body. And the person would look at you like, uh, I don't know why, uh, I don't know if I want to sign off on that. Well, then do you really need this person? You know, and, there, and there's all this conversation that takes place, which becomes a really then data-driven, revenue-driven, profit-driven organization. And some people would say, wow, that's like completely foreign to us. You're speaking a different language. I don't want to have that conversation. To me, the return on higher metric um, is, is just that. It leads to some business conversations that are going to make some business leaders really uncomfortable because that's not how they've led. They've led with, well, here's my budget for next year. And by the way, I need 10% more because I need to add more people. And you're like, why do you need to add more people? Oh, well, because we have this new project. Okay, what's that new project going to bring into the organization? And you know, you keep you know, kind of going down that you know rabbit hole, and where you're kind of putting people in, it becomes back is all back to that performance management side of, are you really utilizing the resources of the organization in the proper manner that you should? And again, then that comes all the way back to HR going, oh wow, performance management. Why does it always come back to performance management? Because <laughs> we don't, we, oh gosh, that means we have to have uncomfortable conversations and hold people accountable and oh, that doesn't seem like very engaging, does it? <laughs> right, right. We, um, you know, we've been, we've been doing a lot of work around this concept of a, of a net talent impact score, right? And really um, what, you know, and this is why I've just rail against turnover as a metric of really anything besides who quit. Um, and you know, it's it, I, a couple of years ago. I wrote a book called Higher Fire and the Walking Dead, and um, and you know, it's Halloween. So what uh, you know, the higher part makes sense. The fire part makes sense. It's the Walking Dead part that turnover just does a terrible job measuring. And, and it's and it's this you know, it's this concept of you hire somebody, you bring them into the organization, and they suck. And what do you have to sh you know? It doesn't count against you if you're measuring turnover, right? It, it's just they just sort of exist, but they're dragging down the entire organization, and really. You know where where we've been doing a lot of work these days is really around this concept of net talent impact and get beyond. Okay, well they're still there, but they still aren't good, and they're still having a, a you know a, a negative impact on the organization. So how do you really measure that? How do you account for that? And you know that's that that's that sort of concept that I talked about in the book of the Walking Dead. You know, did a wrote a blog post on Disrupt HR the, a couple of weeks ago on the you know called the Tale of Two Candidates about you know one candidate goes in. Who, you know, get, who comes in? You hire him from the industry. The guy does a, does a, uh, you know, gets close to his goals, but never clicks with anybody and flames out pretty quickly and quits. You hire somebody else who clicks with everybody, never comes close to the goals, but just sort of exists. You know, which candidate has the which candidate has the worst impact on the organization? It's that candidate who hangs around because they continue to cost you money, right? So, you know, that's that's that measurement that I think that, that we lose. And, I, and you know, looking ahead in 2013, if you're in HR, it's something that you really got to be looking seriously at in terms of, you know, to really get a seat at the table and to really be taken, you know, to really have that bottom line impact on the organization. I think it's really getting away from those traditional metrics of turnover and cost per hire and time to hire and things like that, really focusing in on what impact is this person having to the organization? as the measurement of ultimately, is it a good hire or a bad hire? Not, did they quit? Not, did we have to fire them quickly? Obviously those things you need to track, of course, but you know, ultimately what's, what, what the, the method by which HR can really drive impact to the organization is which hires really met and really drove, uh, drove the organization forward. And I think you know, if that becomes the definition of a good hire, you've got a pretty good story to tell. Um, mm -hmm. Guys, uh, we're about 10 minutes over here. Um, We've had, uh, we, we've had, uh, you know, I, I certainly appreciate you guys being on the call today. Um, George, you want to, uh, you want to wrap us up here real quick? Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. And thanks, um, uh, William and Tim, just uh, really great information and uh, a fun exchange there. Um, uh, 
for uh, all you attendees out there, we want to thank you for uh, attending this webinar today. And you know, at the at the top of the webinar, I mentioned uh, our automated reference checking product, Check Reference. And recently, we launched a completely user enabled version of the software. And you can visit the website uh, right there on your screen. Um, uh, and sign up and within minutes you'll be checking your first reference. It's a very simple process. Uh, uh, we've made it as easy as possible. Um, and you can uh, register for your free license there or the site is also loaded with tons of tutorial videos if you just want to kick it around and explore. Uh, if you do choose to sign up, we've set up a special uh, pricing offer uh, for today only. And uh, it's an unlimited use license if you sign up today. And uh, uh, you'll see how easy it is. But of course, you can always uh, email us if you want to uh, uh, ask a little bit more. And then, of course, if you prefer human interaction, um, our SVP of sales, Mike Panagakos, would be glad to um, uh, talk to you about uh, your specific needs or tell you more about uh, our full suite of products. And uh, his information is right there, Mike P at checks.com. That's C H E Q E D.com or phone number 781. 484-1960. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. There will be a survey at the end. Three quick questions. We'd love to get your feedback. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care. Take care now. The organizer has ended the session, and this.